Gentlemen, welcome, welcome, hello. My name's Nick Talley. I'm a professor here at the University of Newcastle. I actually work in this building in HMRI in uh, gastroenterology research. I'm also the editor in chief of the Medical Journal of Australia. For the last decade, I've been talking publicly about climate change as a health emergency, and uh, I'm thrilled to have this uh, this uh, uh, greening healthcare. Uh, you know, uh, uh, sessions here at uh, in Newcastle. It's just wonderful. So this is the last session. What's the big picture? Policy for sustained healthcare. Before I start making just a few comments, very, very brief, I promise, I do want to also myself acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're all meeting today and pay my respects to elders past and present. So look, uh, this is a very complex space as we've been hearing about all day, and I'm really looking forward to hearing this set of presentations uh, in this almost final session. I'm very, very thrilled that we're going to hear first from Hunter New England Health about how they're going about solving all of these complex problems and uh, how we should all move forward. We're going to hear about being climate and risk ready and how we can successfully mitigate this subsequently. We're also going to hear about the climate risk and net zero unit from the New South Wales Ministry of Health. I'm looking very forward to my previous local health district, Nepi and uh, Blue Mountains, about uh, sustaining uh, 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 and embedding sustainability and a presentation for the Northern Territory. And then finally, from Western Australia, we'll wrap this session up. It should be exciting. It should be interesting. And I can't wait to learn more about the aspirations, targets and goals and find out how these people are going to blow up, I mean blow up, the roadblocks that are present everywhere. Because there are lots of roadblocks still in all of our systems that we need to do something about. In my view and in the view of many, Climate change is really a health emergency and it's getting worse, not getting better. It's going to be our children's problem as well as our own. And it's going to make COVID look like a picnic if we don't deal with it and deal with it effectively. It's going to be critically important. So let's do it. And I'm very pleased to start off uh, our first presentation with Ramsey Awad, who you all know, who's been uh, already introduced, the Director of Infrastructure Planning and Sustainability at Hunter New England uh, Health, and he's been leading a terrific program, and I can't wait to learn more about it. Please come and join us. I don't know who keeps posting these messages. <laughs> Good afternoon. Has everybody enjoyed the session? Yeah. Well, our last session to keep our energy high, I'm going to talk to you about change. How do you drive change in a really big organisation? So, you probably heard, you heard a little bit about from Michael this morning around the work we're doing solar panels and fleet cars, and there's lots and lots of initiatives which I won't bore you with, and we presented a lot recently around that. I'm going to share with you, I guess, our secret sauce today. How, how do you drive change in a large organisation? You heard this morning that Hunter New England is big. We cover rural, metro. We've got 20,000 employees, the busiest ED um, in the state. It's a complicated. Is there a frame right for us? Hello? <laughs> Do I get that time back? Is it working? Okay. So add an extra minute to my clock. There's, a, there's, someone, there against, there's someone with a little sign that says, hurry up, get off. Um, so um, how do you drive it through a large organisation from the top down and from the bottom up? So this is our vision. 
we've we've probably shared it with you guys before, but being carbon and waste neutral by 2030 is ambitious. Um, reducing our footprint while also being fiscally responsible and still understanding that patients are at the core of what we do. And that is incredibly important from my perspective and because I never wanted to put our chief executive and other managers in a situation where they were making decisions around whether to invest in sustainability or in frontline clinical staff. Our core business always has to be frontline clinical staff and dealing with the patients in front of us um, and the most urgent patients. That's, that's a fundamental because you don't want that tension in an organisation. Now, every one of our initiatives that we've put in place has been cost neutral, but the vast majority have saved us an enormous amount of money that we're able to reinvest into clinical care. So that's an important distinction that Hunter New England has driven and has worked really well. And because we're the largest employer, we have the opportunity to be leaders in this particular space. So I'm gonna start off with a little bit, I used to be an academic a few years ago, but they threw me out. Um, and <laughs> I'm gonna talk just a, just a little bit around how you drive change. So there's a really simple model um, which on the left axis is about pressure or tension, creating pressure or tension. And this is just a training mentoring model that people use to coach athletes or to help you buy something. Um, you create some pressure or tension and you, you can do that in a number of different ways. And that bottom axis is about supporting those people to actually hit the target that you actually have set for them. Does that make sense? Now, if you put too much pressure, and that top um, section there on someone, if you make demands which they can't meet, they either crumble or they resist and tell you to bugger off. If you give someone lots of support, here are these great ideas, but there's no pressure, then they just reprioritize it. They say, well, that's not really important. I don't have any pressure on me to drive that or to make that happen. Then it all falls apart very quickly. The idea with change in an individual is to find a sweet spot and everyone's different and you need to be able to sometimes lever the pressure up or down and also that support up or down. And if you get that right, then you will see a change in an individual, in an athlete, or in your, or in your children, or in your partner, however you want to apply it. It's a, it's a model that always works. Now, what we've done is applied that same logic to a large organisation, and it can work in an organisation as big as Hunter New England or larger. And the idea is to set up a series of things on that left hand um, axis, on that pressure tension axis, axis which, which creates a level of tension in an organisation. So I'm going to talk to you about what those elements are. They're all friendly and nice, nothing scary. And then I'll talk to you about the things that we've developed in that support axis that support people and help them be successful. So, and I'll give you some tangible examples. How much time do I have? Am I okay? Uh, so make that six minutes. <laughs> um, so first is presenting a case of case for change, explaining why you are doing this. Excite people, let them understand why this is so important. So Hunter New England, I won't show it to you, but we created a lot of media. We created a video, a movie that essentially explained why this is important for our community, for our staff, um, for our children. You then establish some goals. Okay, so we've got a series of goals there. I'm not going to run them through you because I've only got four minutes um, to do that. But there are a series of goals that we've set up for the program and the strategy. <clears throat> then you need performance targets and measures. There's no point having a large strategy without some measures to measure your success. And Michael ran through some of those targets that we've exceeded this year. And hopefully we're going to exceed this year or... Alyssa will be out on her ear. But um, these are important to have as an organisation to stay accountable. Then we have, as soon as you've got performance measures and targets, you need data collection. And we've got a great data collection um, set up here, which captures everything we do and tabulates that in terms of savings and carbon emissions and water savings and electricity savings. So having that information is really powerful. Next, you need governance. So we have a governance structure which cascades from the board. So at board level, there is a sustainability subgroup. They talk about sustainability. You have an executive at the next level in myself that drives sustainability. We haven't achieved sustainability um, cascading all the way through to the organisation, but we're getting there and that will take time. But we have governance around that. Then...
It's an extra 30 seconds I should be getting. Here we go. Um, so all of those elements there, the governance, the data, the performance metrics, the case for change, that creates tension and pressure. As soon as you have that in an organisation, people start to feel it and think this is important and this is where um, this organisation's heading and I need to get on board with that. So there, that's the tension side of things. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, let's talk about supporting people then. Supporting people, rewarding and recognising the work people are doing. So Hunter New England has sustainability awards now. We acknowledge and um, recognise all the good work that's done. People that do a great job, we get them to go and present to other parts of the district. Um, and our chief executive has a weekly newsletter which advertises and communicates all the good things people are doing in that space. The other thing we do is we put ourselves in for awards. So we won the New South Wales um, Baxter Award for Sustainability this year. Um, there's a whole raft of other initiatives that we've put our hands up for. Again, rewarding and promoting excellence. It encourages people and supports people doing these things. Next is establishing communities of interest. There's a raft of communities of interest up there, which um, we are partnering with at an international level, Australia level, state level, and a local level. Again, bringing those people together, and we have a group of sustainability champions. We have got about 150 of them across Hunter New England Health that drive initiatives in their own um, areas of expertise, be it in HR, IT, or theatres. So those people, we get them all in touch with each other, they talk to each other, they support each other, they share ideas and steal ideas from each other, which is wonderful. The next piece, and there's only a couple more and I'm done, um, time's up is a little sign at the front here. Um, but because, you know, we're hosting this, I reckon I could take an extra 30 seconds, don't you think? Nick? How's that for arrogance? Take an extra 30 seconds, thank you. Um, managing and sharing knowledge. How do you take all these wonderful ideas that are coming up um, in Tamworth and uh, other parts of our district and package that information up so we don't lose it, we capture it, then we get it in a package which is shareable and we get it out to other parts of the district, other parts of the state, other parts of the world. That's knowledge sharing and that's what part of Alyssa and my role is, is managing that process. And then finally, um, providing leadership um, and resource and innovation. So I, I, am, um, I still think I'm the only executive with sustainability in their title in New South Wales Health. Um, having someone who can make decisions, has some form of budget, um, has um, someone like Alyssa, you need an Alyssa in place, but no one's allowed to pinch Alyssa. I know people have been offering her jobs today. So I amended <laughs> that slide very quickly. Um, and a group, because frontline clinical staff are busy with their everyday jobs, so we can't expect them to constantly be looking outside of their own borders for ideas. So part of Alyssa's role in, in, within our team is to partner with universities, the private sector, partner with our staff to generate and create new ideas. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ramsey, that was great. So are we climate risk ready? We're now gonna have three presenters, one online, two in person, I believe, talk about this and it's wonderful to welcome them. Uh, the first is Tiffany Correggio, who is Senior Project Officer in Climate Preparedness in the newly established Office of Energy and Climate Change within New South Wales, Treasury. The second person, they're coming up on the stage now, thank you, uh, Ingrid Segovia is Program Manager for Sustainability at New South Wales Health Infrastructure. And the third is Sue Crosby, who uh, is from the Dampe and Blue Mountains Health District, wonderful health district, and um, she's here as well. She's the Director um, of uh, the Climate Risk and Net Zero Office for the district. So welcome. Thank you very much for your presentation. Looking forward to it. Thanks, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, I am yeah, Tiffany Correggia from the Office of Energy and Climate Change, formerly in D 
Pi and then in DPE and then we were embedded into Treasury. Um, so I'm just I'm going to introduce the um, the talk today with with Sue and Ingrid. And sorry I couldn't be there in person, but I just wanted to give a little bit of the framing around Climate Risk Ready and I guess what we do here at OECC and how we came across Ingrid and Sue and how we've been supporting them to do the great work that they've been doing around um, Climate Risk Ready and preparedness for um, for New South Wales Health, but also for um, the Nepean Blue Mountains LHD. So I think if we just skip onto the first slide, I'll run through. I know we've only got 10 minutes all together, so I won't um, go, yeah, I won't hammer on too much. But yeah, first of all, I'd like to just um, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the Awakbu lands on which we meet today, or which everyone there is meeting today. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal people that are here um, or there today. Thank you. So I think we just jump into the next slide. Thank you very much. I guess, and I probably don't need to hammer on about this too much to everybody there, but just to re really reiterate that the climate change impacts are happening now. This isn't necessarily, this isn't something that we're going to see in 20 or 30 years. We've, it's absolutely no surprise to anybody. We've had, you know, event after event and, you know, from 2019 when we had the bushfires, which was actually when we launched Climate Was Ready, we launched it in sort of a cloud of smoke um, over Sydney. We've also obviously had the recent devastating floods this year um, but there's also been um, the heat waves and drought and I think it's it's worth mentioning that New South Wales has warmed by between 1.4 and 1.6 which is actually faster than the global average and is faster than the Australian average as well so I think that probably that message is probably not lost on everybody who's sitting in the audience there. I think if we jump into the next slide, please. And just to demonstrate that, you know, this climate change does pose this risk, but also opportunities for New South Wales. I think it's easy for us to envisage the risk and the impact on physical assets. You know, we can think of bridges being washed away, roads being damaged with potholes, um, you know, electricity pylons being knocked down by bushfires, but it really is to try and demonstrate that there's there's this impact on all of our um, priorities so from physical assets to infrastructure but also to services and objectives and the way that we invest and we finance projects as well so we need to think about climate risk and adaptation across all of those lenses not just as the physical assets that we may need to build differently or that may be destroyed and we'll have to replace so if we jump to the next slide, please, and just to demonstrate that we have, so we've had the net zero plan for a little bit longer than we've had the adaptation um, strategy. So the net zero plan obviously is on the mitigation side. How do we, how do we mitigate the emissions in the future? The adaptation strategy is really taking, taking into account that there is a certain amount of change that is already baked into the system. Even if we stopped emitting carbon tomorrow, we would still have some change that is already bedded into the system. So we need to assess and we need to adapt um, to those changes and to those risks. So the adaptation strategy was released um, in June of this year, and that really is is the whole of government's response to try and make New South Wales more resilient to a changing climate. It does so through these four different pillars, which is having the right metrics, having um, consistent kind of climate risk assessment across the whole of government, um, adaptation plans to actually deal with that risk um, and realise the opportunities and also to embed climate risk into decision making, making sure that we're making decisions at every level that consider the, the changing risk profiles going forwards. We jump to the next slide, please. So Climate Risk Ready came about, um, and it really is, I guess, our role is about trying to have integrity in the system across government, trying to increase the whole of government preparedness. So we've been working with, we were only embedded in Treasury this year, but our team has been working with Treasury for, for the past sort of four years or so to really try and work on how do we how do we make sure that climate risk and preparedness is mainstreamed throughout government. It's not just sort of an arm of DPI or DPE or whoever, wherever we sit, um, who have sort of carriage um, over, over climate risk across government. So we do that through four different ways. And we actually run a whole of government preparedness survey, which we ran in 2018 last. And that really helped us to build this climate risk ready program. So we realized that there were these four pillars that needed kind of improvement that was improving the authorizing environment. So 
we have an interagency climate risk steering group, making sure that we can um, integrate climate risk management into different treasury policies like CBA guidelines, um, risk management policies. So using the levers that we can to make sure there's the right authorizing environment, but also building capacity and skills. So once you, you know, we, we understand there is risk, but how do we actually, how do we actually identify those risks? So we do that through Climate Risk Ready New South Wales Guide, which is based a framework for climate risk assessment, um, which is based on international standards. So that really is, okay, I can take, I have a hospital or I have a project or I have a piece of infrastructure. How do I actually conduct a climate change risk assessment? How do I take the sort of hypothetical, the data over here? How do I embed that and actually understand what the impacts may be and come and develop a risk assessment and then adaptation plan? So we have, which is how we came across um, Sue and Ingrid, who both took part in the nationally accredited training that we also run alongside that. So that training, the Climate Risk Ready training, really does help support to, to, to actually undertake that climate change risk assessment under that um, under that framework. So we have a few other things around supporting with adaptation plans, um, improving disclosure and management as well. We have three entities who are who were directed by the minister this year to actually um, voluntarily disclose under the task force for climate related financial disclosures. So there's a lot of things happening. I'm so sorry that I completely whizzed through that, but I will just to give you, hopefully that give you a bit of background as to where Climate Is Ready came from and I guess what Treasury and OECC's interest is. Um, and then I'll just, I'll hand over to Sue, um, who can actually talk about, I guess, how they took that and then practically implemented it. Thanks. Right, so Nepembra Mountains consists of both urban and semi-rural areas covering over 9,000 square kilometres and a population of about 350,000 people. We have one tertiary and three district hospitals, one private public <coughs> partnership with Hawkesbury, one aged care facility that we manage out at Portland and nine community health centres. Since 2019, we have been imp impacted by severe bushfires, flooding events and storms. We are living climate change today, but we know it will only get worse. As the chair of the Climate Resilient Healthcare Working Group, when I saw the Climate Risk Ready course, I knew it would support the development of the Climate Risk Ready Healthcare Plan, which is the key strategy for our Climate Resilient Healthcare Focal Point document. Lots of Climate Risk Ready in there. Uh, so during the course, I started a collaboration with Ingrid and she was already working with ACOM consultants. We decided to use a pilot site at Nepean Blue Mountains to, to further develop the Climate Risk Ready tools with a health focus. They could then be used to roll out the process across my district and also be shared with other LHDs and health entities. In 2021, the pilot was completed for Blue Mountains District Anzac Memorial Hospital, located between Lura and Katoomba and built in 1927. The whole site is a heritage listed item and it's the only Anzac Memorial Hospital in New South Wales. The original foyer and cenotaph, I'm glad I got that word out right, are of high significance at the core of the hospital facility. This site was chosen as it is a smaller site due to its aging infrastructure and high climate risk from extreme storms, snow and bushfire. Uh, the tools uh, that we uh, decided to develop, uh, sorry, the key tool that required a health specific focus uh, was the risk register and in particular the risk matrix. The climate risk ready matrix did not include health specific risks and the health matrix did not include climate change risks or an appropriate timeline for climate change. So we developed a new one based on both tools with appropriate timelines, climate change risks, and a consequence table based on the New South Wales health format so that other New South Wales health entities could use the uh, tool easily, but would look familiar for them. Uh, for the pilot, the first steps in implementing the workshops were to gain executive approval and to determine who should attend including external partners like the Primary Health Network and HealthShare. We then sent a set of pre-reading slides to the participants. These slides included a basic level of understanding on why climate change impacts severe weather events, an overview of the facility being assessed, historical data on severe weather events, and the impacts to the site or the district. 
It also included a basic understanding of the climate projections modeling specific to the site. The pre-reading helped participants to really understand the why of why we need to do this body of work. The first pilot workshop refined the risk statements that we had developed for a health facility and risk rated the site being assessed. The second pilot workshop reviewed the current and future adaptation strategies. We have had a few iterations of how we ran the workshops and we have developed the risk register template to the point where we could do one workshop for our final four facilities and two service delivery based workshops. The register now shows the whole district on one tool with one tab for facilities showing facilities most at risk that you can see there. One tab for services with district wide ratings and actions, as well as space to input specific risks for a service if required. And you can see there's a director uh, pharmacy risk specifically shown there. And a one tab for public health risks because they were the same across the district. Along with Ingrid and myself, the project team consisted of our disaster manager and our enterprise risk manager. Our risk manager has enabled climate change to be embedded into standard process with overall governance managed by the Climate Resilient Healthcare Working Group and high level risks are reported to the board subcommittees annually. Projections will start to be supported by data and risk ratings and actions will need to be continuously reviewed and updated according to actual climate change that we see. And I'll now hand over to Ingrid to talk about the health infrastructure aspects. Thank you, sir. And we've already had the two minute mark, so. Okay, no, no, that's fine. Um, so I can't hide behind here because I'm too short. So I'll... Um, Just grab a mic. Okay. Is it the one that... Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Is that it? Can you hear me? Okay, fantastic. So I'll skip that slide. I wanted to show you this slide because, I, I mean, you're all aware of the complexity of the organisation that we work in. And we've got health infrastructure highlighted there as a small part, but we all have a part to play. Uh, and then we have all the wonderful health districts, local health districts and specialty networks in the middle. I think it's really important to understand that we do work in a complex organisation. And in order to... Um, make change and work together. It is about collaboration and to break down some of these barriers. The other opportunity that when we were, when we joined together with the opportunity of the Climate Risk Ready course with Tiffany and then the opportunity of do, having the, the Climate Risk Ready uh, support, which was fantastic having ACOM work with us as part of a collaborative project to implement this and I think that's the key to this and that's why it was successful because it wasn't health infrastructure in isolation and I say this all the time within my organization is we can't work in a silo we need to work in partnership with our local health districts and I feel that the organization is support is does support that collaboration so the opportunity of uh, the reporting form that was uh, we all received from the Ministry of Health also provided an opportunity for myself within health infrastructure to take it through our board, through our executive, to really consider and then embed climate risk into our risk registers. And then the opportunity to start, so my role is about developing a health, uh, uh, it sustainability framework for the organization that is health infrastructure and that covers capital projects it covers um the precinct projects and it also covers asset management so which is a key part of this because if we can you know we are looking at climate risks through our projects and we are uh, embedding it and starting to look at what it means for our assets in in our asset management framework but the connection between those is really important because what we deliver as part of a capital infrastructure then gets handed over and the process that we've developed will help maintain and get, have a continuous understanding of where we sit from a climate risk and resilience perspective. 
And really, again, it's all about the opportunity and taking the opportunity and the wonderful people that really came together to work collaboratively. And I think as New South Wales Health, I find that everywhere I go. And in terms of then our next steps with this, it's really about looking at opportunities to embed it. And it's looking at our strategic asset plans and our asset management. And that's your role. Our, our local health districts do that and they deliver that um, with HI as well. So it is about working together to embed it across our processes through planning and design, which is through our capital projects, looking at it through the whole life cycle of a project and what do we need to consider at what stage? And we want this tool, and that's the next step, is to trial this tool in our projects to deliver the outcomes we are looking for. And lastly, procurement. And that's another uh, final point about how important it is that we drive change, not just in our activities, but, the, but through our whole supply chain. Um, thank you very much. So thank you very much. We now move on um, to Erin Johnson, who's the Policy Officer for the Climate uh, Risk and Net Zero Unit, a new unit, New South Wales Health, Health and she's got a pre-recorded presentation on the Net Zero Unit. Thank you. Let me join this afternoon's session. I'm Erin Johnson. I'm a Policy Officer within the New South Wales Ministry of Health's New Climate Risk and Net Zero Unit. Firstly, I'd like to add my acknowledgement of country, acknowledging the tra traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting today. For myself, that's the Camaragal people. We honour the ancestors of yesterday, the custodians of today and those of tomorrow. We recognise their continuing connection to land and waters and how culture is held, nurtured and shared, and that the principles of stewardship and caring for country are important guiding principles in New South, New South Wales climate risk response. In today's presentation, I'd like to provide an overview of what our Climate Risk and Net Zero Unit is doing, what our core responsibilities are, and how we plan on supporting New South Wales transition to a low carbon, low waste, climate resilient system. Firstly, I'd like to start with the fundamental principle that guides our unit's activities, and that is that climate change is a substantial health issue. This comes as no surprise to all of you who are joined here today. However, fundamentally, the changing climate is increasingly having substantial impacts on health and our health services. And we observe this through not just only the direct impacts of the increased frequency of severe storms, which have recently devastated some parts of our northern New South Wales community, but alongside flooding, bushfire and extreme heat events, which are particularly significant challenges for our Western Sydney urban populations. Alongside this, we need to consider the shifts in infectious diseases, rises in allergens, food and water insecurity, forced human migration, civil conflict and mental health impacts. We understand that these impacts are not equally distributed and are in fact disproportionately impacting our most vulnerable cohorts, including our elderly, our Aboriginal communities, our rural and remote communities. And there is overwhelming scientific evidence that climate change is supercharging our climate. With the latest IPCC report stating that we need to rapidly reduce emissions this decade across every sector, including within health, to avoid catastrophic climate breakdown. There's a comprehensive suite of existing climate change policies in place within New South Wales, including the New South Wales Government Net Zero Plan, which is the foundation for New South Wales action on climate change and the goal to reach net zero emissions by 2050. The New South Wales Government has established two clear requirements for us. Firstly, we are required to address our transition risk and decarbonise health. And secondly, we need to adapt to physical climate risks. We know that the health system itself has a substantial carbon footprint because globally we're part of the problem. If the health system were a country, it'd be the fifth largest source of carbon pollution on the planet. We as a system use huge amounts of resources, we produce vast amounts of waste, we continue to use fossil fuel energies, and within New South Wales, it's modelled that the health system comprises 7% of the state's emissions and 8% of the state's waste. Health has the highest greenhouse gas emissions of all New South Wales government clusters. With that, we have a substantial carbon footprint and a responsibility to reduce our emissions and transition to net zero. What are we doing about it? 
as a higher meeting sector, health is committed to the New South Wales government targets and to reducing and meeting and exceeding the goals across scope one, two and three emissions. Under our future health strategy, New South Wales Health is committed to delivering an environmentally sustainable footprint for future healthcare. Whilst we understand this responsibility, we also recognise that there is a tremendous opportunity to improve health and the health human experience of healthcare because so many decarbonisation activities are so well aligned with our other future health priorities, including elevating the experience of our staff and our consumers, virtual care and value-based healthcare. Research shows that more than half of the health system's carbon footprint is from clinical care, which includes pharmaceuticals, medical devices, equipment, food services and so on. Within New South Wales Health, we have made a start to developing a climate risk response and a new unit has been established to work alongside our colleagues within the energy, infrastructure, fleet and procurement teams who have been making steps in this direction for some time now. We have recently released our position statement which is publicly available on our new website and this provides an overview of our unit's priorities including our core responsibilities and priorities of metrics, developing low carbon models of care and staff engagement. We have a shared vision for New South Wales Health to be a leading modern, low carbon, low waste, climate resilient health system by focusing on innovation, value, quality and equity. Much of our existing units activities are in fact modelled on international best practice, which includes the Green NHS's program and their focus on sustainable models of care, workforce, networks, leadership and metrics. By concentrating efforts on establishing the right structures and governance and identifying the appropriate levers, which includes policies to support our response. Our unit's activities are overseen by our Environmental Sustainability Steering Committee in partnership with our local health districts, sustainability networks and our specialty health networks, pillar organisations and other New South Wales health entities. We're also working alongside our external stakeholders including the Office of Energy and Climate Change which sits within the New South Wales Treasury cluster. There are many staff across the system who are acting to improve patient experience and reduce emissions in a range of initiatives which includes using less polluting anaesthetic gases to reducing single-use plastics in theatres, repairing and reusing mobility aids and a range of food waste reduction initiatives. You've heard about some of this great work earlier today from colleagues at Hunter New England Local Health District, the Sydney Children's Hospital Network, South Western Sydney Local Health District and the Nepean Blue Mountains Local Health District. We, we recognise that these changes will be required across the system to decarbonise health and that much of this work will in fact be led by our frontline staff. As such, we've recently established a Net Zero Leads program where we're supporting 10 of our senior clinical staff across nursing, allied health and medical professions to redesign and reimagine their service or specialty through a Net Zero lens. These leads will act as change agents for the system and lead a network of like-minded peers working in partnership with researchers to measure the carbon costs of their investigations procedures, services and clinical pathways to develop and implement scalable low carbon models of care for New South Wales. We're also undertaking comprehensive carbon footprinting of one metropolitan and one regional based hospital in partnership with our Nepean Blue Mountains and Northern New South Wales local health districts and the Office of Energy and Climate Change alongside our expert carbon footprinting consultants 2XE. As part of our commitment to scale up and coordinate environmental sustainable action across the public health system, New South Wales Health recently joined as an official member of GGHH's Pacific Network alongside the Victorian, Queensland, ACT and WA departments. We understand and appreciate that Australia is one of the countries at the front line of climate health impact, so our health services and systems will have to become prepared and resilient to climate threats. We need to build resilience and adaptation capability across our systems, workforces, services, supply chains and infrastructure so that they're prepared for the climate impacts that are baked into the system for decades to come. The New South Wales Government has recently released its climate change adaptation strategy which builds upon the New South Wales Government's net zero plan and this will guide our adaptation response prioritising climate change risk metrics, the development of change risk and opportunity assessments, the delivery of adaptation action plans 
and climate change adaptation being embedded into all New South Wales government decision making. Whilst we recognise we have made a start, we also recognise that there is much more to do across our health system to respond to climate risk so that we can continue to provide quality healthcare, not just today, but into the future. We also know and recognise that this is an area that many of our staff care deeply about and increasingly our community expect us, expects us to act upon. New South Wales Health is just at the start of our journey. So as we look to the future, we'll continue to work in partnership with our frontline staff, our key stakeholders, our New South Wales government colleagues, primary care organisations, industry, research, innovation groups and suppliers to drive this work across the system and achieve a more environmentally sustainable footprint for future healthcare. We look forward to working and learning from many of you here today and thank you again for the opportunity to share our unit's initial learnings and insights. Thank you. So I'd not like to now ask for Sue Cosby to come back up to the stage to talk about embedding environmental sustainability at their local health district. Thank you very much. Uh, so firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands we're meeting on today. I acknowledge their long history of caring for the environment and that we must work together to care for the land now and into the future. I pay my respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to other Aboriginal people here today. And I'd also like to say kia ora to those joining us from over the ditch, uh, which is also my homeland. In 2018, I attended a presentation given by David Pension, who spoke to us earlier today. And at the time I needed a project to complete my MBA. So I discussed doing something for sustainability with Scott Hansen, who I met there. Scott was new to our organization as the energy and sustainability business partner. And unfortunately he couldn't join us today to present with me. So I'm up here on my own. Uh, we started with a grand plan to set up sustainability in our district. We very quickly came to the realization that we couldn't do all of that in a six month project. So we started with one component of the plan, which was to develop a tool to prior, prioritize sustainability projects. And you can see a snapshot of that tool on the screen. However, after I completed my MBA, we realized we still needed to do all of the other components of the plan that we had originally developed. And uh, we, we started with uh, the sustainability plan 2019 to 2023. And we wanted to ensure that the plan had strong governance and flexibility so it didn't end up getting dusty on a shelf. And this led to the structure on the slide, which provides the foundations for, our, for, our, for sustainability in our district. It has the three pillars of documents, people and portal, which we will explore in the next slides. So the people are the sustainability committee that's chaired by our director of finance. Uh, and that was a strategic choice because let's face it, if you want to get anything through, you have to get it past the DOF. Uh, the membership of this committee consists of our executive staff and we also have a very supportive CE and board. The working groups of this committee have our subject matter experts and the staff who are passionate about sustainability. They are the sustainability engine at the and Blue Mountains. The focal point documents are the working documents that get managed by our working groups. They outline the mandatory and aspirational targets, performance indicators, risks and measures of success. These documents can be updated and added to during the life of the plan as new policy needs, opportunities or technology are identified. We have recently developed two new focal points, one for net zero planning and one for green and healthy travel. These two areas, uh, these are two areas that have increased in priority since we developed the plan in 2019. As you can see on the slide, the building working group manages six focal point documents. Transport working group now has two and the waste working group only has one, but we will give them some credit. It's a pretty big area. These three working groups uh, work on the reduction strategies uh, to ensure resource efficiency of healthcare delivery. The fourth group, uh, the one that I chair, is the Climate Resilient Healthcare Working Group, and that manages the foster participa 
foster staff participation and partnerships. The climate resilient healthcare working focal point and the new net zero planning focal point. This working group has members from PHN, councils and universities, and it is the key working group towards adaptation, including managing climate risk and resilience. The membership sets up strong collaboration opportunities with key players across our community, across all the working groups and with our staff. It is also working on collaborative opportunities for research and community innovations. The third pillar is the portal for all things sustainable. This is the space where all staff can find out what's happening across our district. And there was a question earlier about, you know, how do you connect with your staff? And this is the, the first way that we've attempted to do this. Um, it provides access to the plan and the midway review that we've already completed. Uh, it's got all the focal point documents and their strategic objectives. We can highlight case studies and news stories, and we also have links to all the other agencies that are relevant to us. We load all the committee and working group meeting minutes and presentations, so it's a really open environment. We're not trying to hide anything or, or do, and there's no secret, secret squirrel business going on. And we are in the process of developing a sustainability dashboard. And uh, as was said earlier by Erin, that we're working with the ministry. We were lucky to be successful for the climate, the carbon footprinting project and all the data that we developed for that. It's got a, a ready built home to live in that everybody can access. Uh, we have a sustainability uh, advocacy program to support staff in developing and progressing <laughs> initiatives. And we use the prioritization tool from the first slide to assess and support these initiatives. Uh, we have developed a sustainability impact assessment tool for other projects and plans or change management processes across the district. And we also have a register for sustainability specific projects. The projects register provides an opportunity for all staff to learn what has been considered in the past, what makes a project succeed or fail, and how we can replicate success or mitigate failures in future projects. And that's why we like to put the failures up there so that we can learn and grow from them. The template identifies what support is needed and interested staff can either offer their support or expertise, thereby increasing staff involvement. And if a project has been successfully implemented in one department, other departments can choose to implement the idea without having to reinvent the wheel. Importantly, the register shows a snapshot of what we have done or are doing towards a sustainable future. It's very easy to feel deflated about the issues, and this is a positive way that we can show all of our staff what we are doing well, what we are working towards, and to celebrate our successes. Uh, while the setup of the sustainability structure has taken time and COVID has certainly had its impact, we are now starting to get tangible results. What started with Scott and myself now has a groundswell of 60 plus committee and working group members. Rather than a couple of passionate people trying to do everything on top of their normal work commitments, we now have a dedicated sustain environmental sustainability office and more people are each taking a smaller slice of the work pie. The activity is starting to intensify and we expect to see the results continue to snowball over the coming couple of years. Success to date has been helped by our executive being very aware of the climate challenges we face and also the need to manage emerging policy drivers such as the government resource efficiency and net zero policies. My two takeaway messages for today, if you have a passion for sustainability, find like-minded people to work with and encourage and support each other. And just as has been said today, work within your sphere of influence and take the time to develop solid foundations for sustainability relevant to your organization. It will pay off over time. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now move to the Northern Territory and I'm very pleased to introduce our two speakers who are online. First, Dr. Mark D'Souza, who's an emergency specialist at the Royal Darwin Hospital. And he initiated the Sustainable Healthcare Committee 
the Northern Territory Health. And then Aunty Billawarra Lee is a senior elder of the Larakai Nation of Darwin and a member of the Kabilo family. She wears many hats. She's very well known. She was recently recognised as the top end NADOC female elder of the year. Congratulations for that. And welcome to your presentation, which is about healthy patients, workforce and environment. Thank you. Can everyone see my screen? Can everyone hear my hear us talk? Uh, hi, Mark. We can hear you talk, but could you turn it up, possibly? Oh, we'll just come closer. It's a, it's a microphone issue. We'll speak up. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having us. We're dialing in from Larrakia country where you've got a, a real life present uh, Larrakia elder and we give our respects to the past and emerging leaders. Um, so we've seen that policymakers could need good data on financial emissions and emissions reductions in order to decarbonize healthcare. But in the next few minutes, what Auntie B and I would like to do is share our grassroots project at Royal Darwin Hospital, where the co-benefits are actually well-being and staff engagement and that of its community. The, this project, which we call the H3 project, was pitched to the health leadership in September last year in response to the exhaustion that healthcare workers were experiencing from prolonged COVID response, staff shortages, hospital overcrowding and workplace aggression. And these things have been going in health services all around Australia. And at the same time, I presented to them Kaha's Real Urgent Now um, uh, paper, which conveyed the alarm and frustration that healthcare workers were feeling at the lack of organisational response to the health impacts of climate change. And critical incidents were really high, as were patient complaints, and staff mor morale was poor, especially for frontline ED workers, for example. And what became apparent was that Royal Darwin's precinct was failing to provide climate adapted COVID safe outdoor areas. Instead, what they had was these sorts of landscapes and staff were making use of whatever shade that was available in a campus that was rampant with the heat island effect. And can you imagine being a stressed healthcare worker trying to relax and recharge in this place, much less trying to maintain any passion for working in post pandemic healthcare. And as this thermal imaging courtesy of our colleague Steve Cook from CRS IRO shows, pedestrians of all kinds were being exposed to surface temperatures in excess of 55 degrees as they tried to walk from a distant car park to a hospital entrance. And in fact, one mother I interviewed described this journey with her mobility impaired daughter as an SAS training exercise. And so the pitch was, provide immediate psychological first aid to healthcare system at breaking point. And we do this by creating cool and restorative green spaces for all campus users and thereby improve their well-being and provide adaptation to the projected warming situation in the wet tropics. We also wanted to engage and recruit healthcare workers to participate in climate actions in the workplace as projects emerged. And we believe that as we inform participants of the sustainability projects, and how they can help, they're more likely to apply this literacy, not only in the healthcare setting, but in their homes, through their social networks, the marketplace and their electorates. And so we also wanted to campaign for the health leadership committee to put climate adaptation and mitigation on cross sectoral agendas within government. And after this, if this all worked, we would consider community engagement. And so our timelines looked like a series of um, phased campus greening projects to make use of rainfall coming into our wet season uh, in December last year. We were going to use low cost biophilic landscaping within the constraints of what we see as Royal Darwin's legacy infrastructure and pretty much absent funding. Uh, we would recruit champions through um, literacy building um, uh, projects using email, uh, new email systems, 
volunteer programs uh, for gardening, develop intranet resources, and spruik at various staff forums. And we wanted our campus greening project to tessellate with another project that the Sustainable Healthcare Committee was designing, which was an active mobility program that would encourage staff uh, to walk and ride to work and use green spaces to take their breaks and make them more restorative. We sought operational funding for these activities and also called for the recruitment of the Territory's first um, health sustainability officer. And this was all endorsed in principle. They thought it was a great idea, but unfortunately no funding flowed. And so why is biophilia so important? Um, as um, we've already heard from our indigenous uh, colleagues here, it's, it's, an, it's, it's a very ancient concept, but it's been, it was coined in this term in the 60s and in um, 40 years later became a complex hypothesis on designing the built hypothesis. And we all know at our heart that we have in this innate human instinct to connect with nature and other living beings. There's a lot of evidence out there about the health benefits of green spaces in schools and workplaces and increasing evidence of the benefits on health campuses. They promote stress reduction, they elevate our mood, hasten recovery, reduce the need for pain medication, and importantly for policymakers, they show greater satisfaction with the health service. And I'm gonna pass over to Auntie Billawara who's gonna talk about how deeply embedded biophilia has been for indigenous people. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am a recognized traditional healer. And for me, Western medical facilities is a foreign environment for First Nations peoples. It's cold and frightening. We have such a high population of people from very remote areas who are used to living quite differently from the built environment. So medical staff are trying to heal us up off Mother Earth, disconnected from Mother Nature, and we can't access our um, bush medicines. So this project with Mark is, is so important because it's going to make a big difference um, for the healing journey of our Aboriginal patients. As a healer, excuse me, access to our bush medicines is going to make my role a lot easier. So, you know, particularly like the ironwood tree, it is fundamentally critical for our smoking ceremonies. And the smoking ceremony is the first always fundamental thing that we do when we're going to do a healing and it doesn't matter whether you're coming through with your traditional healing or whether you're going through the western medical system the smoking ceremony is critically important so this project um i back completely and i'll continue to work with mark and my brothers and that who are very knowledgeable about the bush medicines are also engaged thank you Annie B. Look, there's a lot of si climate science that we know is ignored and, and, and cheekily used for its own purpose uh, when it suits policymakers to spruik certain things and not others. But it's clear that a green climate adapted health precinct, it performs better. In Darwin, CSIRO has shown that there's a 22 degree Celsius reduction in land surface temperature achieved through shading, providing um, green trees and canopies for evapotranspiration and reflecting heat. Uh, it also increases active mobility so that you have um, improved outdoor thermal activity and engagement with active mobility. And of course, what better nature-based solution um, for carbon sequestration is there than trees? Climate adapted health precincts also make us feel better. Uh, emergency staff are reporting the positive impact of this garden, which is at the rear entrance of the emergency department, which means they can attend it very quickly on a break. Uh, as little as five to 20 minutes of exposure to these sorts of gardens for healthcare workers is being shown to improve wellness and productivity. And frequent exposures are probably having a compounded restorative effect. Uh, Menzies researchers are also um, involved. They've, they took great delight in um, planting this shady trellis uh, on a barren um, built-in uh, structure that was just sitting there un unplanted and also the medical students who are going to inherit the health workforce are getting engaged. They're really chuffed to know that the planting of flowering plants in this green wall, which you saw in the introductory slide, which is now in full, full flower, 
is increasing biodiversity and the native bees, which produce sugar bag honey, which is really important for indigenous people culturally and tastes delicious, uh, are being supported by the flowering plants. Our volunteers are aged between three and 70 and they provide, of course, a, a willing and free workforce. And since December 2021, we've had 453 shrubs and grasses go in the ground. And almost th these are almost exclusively top end natives. And because we had no funding, the money's come from staff specialist donors, hospital wellbeing and support services fund, uh, from Rotary and from individual members of the community through trees and goods like that. And a special shout out to our director of support services, Mark McDonald, who really lives up to his title. It's really important that land care um, is, is cherished by these sorts of programs and our, our volunteers achieve that. Um, and caring for country is essentially land care. Our volunteers learn skills like how to uh, use um, freely available hospital cardboard to mulch uh, and, and suppress weeds instead of using Roundup. And land care is contributing to um, uh, us overcoming environmental generational amnesia, where it becomes more and more normalized for environmental degradation to become the norm for each generation. And our working bees are also breaking down barriers. Here's our director of medical services, swinging a pick with medical students and members of the community. It allows community members to give back to the healthcare uh, service, which they know has been struggling in the past two years. And here's a, an example of our hospital comms and Facebook page, which we're using to inform the workforce and recruit our volunteers, which number over 150. It's really important, as we said, that active mobility is targeted um, so that people are more encouraged to engage in those uh, activities which allow us to be more physio physiologically adapted to a warming tropical climate. And we're also targeting footpaths which have been there for many years. This, this will be a shady canopied area where people can walk through without becoming desiccated and they can also linger. It's important that things like um, seating, uh, water taps and um, those sorts of structures can be put in to support people lingering. And it's not just about the clinical workers. This is a, an industrialized zone of the hospital where we planted some edible, edible plants like rosellas. This is where support service staff like engineering and housekeeping congregate because it's near their area and we want them to benefit from cool restorative green spaces as well. So finally, our next steps, there's so much to do, Arnie B. Yeah. Um, we've got wet season coming up, so there's a plan for an Indigenous accommodation precinct to um, be planted out, again with some donated plants from a local enthusiast. Uh, trilingual signage is, is a project in, in progress, and we've got an internet resource package that we're, um, we have stolen, as Ramsey said, off the Hunter New England and adapted it to us. And it's time to keep pitching for operational commitment so it can can stay with the volunteers engaging and adapting in therapeutic horticulture, as I've outlined, but we need this to become operationally funded. Thank you very much. Another inspiring talk. Our last presentation uh, comes from Western Australia. It's a great pleasure to introduce Tyrone Weramanthri, who's president of the Public Health Association of Australia, a former Chief Health Officer for both Western Australia and the Northern Territory, who's going to talk about lessons from the Climate Health Inquiry in WA. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nick. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, great to be in this session. I've learned a heap um, by listening to the other speakers. Um, I'm joining you from Wajak Noongar land. I acknowledge the traditional owners, pay my respects to elders past and present, and sincerely thank them for their stewardship of this beautiful environment. Do have the next slide, please? So I wanna talk about the Climate Health Inquiry, but just quickly to reflect where we are now. I think we could all find a metaphor or two for the situation we, as a, as a species, find ourselves on a trajectory towards whatever we'd like to define it as. And what's surprising is that the immediate impacts um, which are now um, occurring, we expected that when they'd hit, we'd be acting much faster. 
but that doesn't seem to be happening. Um, we know that climate change is, is a health issue and much has changed in the health sector over the last few years. And it's terrific to see um, all of the um, policy frameworks, activities at all levels described um, this afternoon. So there's strong green shoots of activity and growing networks. But because we, were, we had a decade where we really didn't do too much or make much progress, there are still many gaps and inconsistencies. So I think we'd all um, agree that we need to slow down our emissions and be clear that we haven't yet really bent that curve at all. Um, we need to speed up change. And indeed, we need to go, uh, we need to change course fundamentally and radically as well. And that goes to the other issue about the broader societal issues, the broader commercial interests, which are pretty much um, unchallenged. And that is a contextual factor for the health um, discussion. Thank you. So um, over two and a half years ago, um, we produced a report, which was the um, end of a year's process. We'll never get a chance to do this again. It was a statutory inquiry. I had a year to do it. It was an act of curatorship, bringing together at that time, all of the uh, experts in WA and providing a path forward for the health department and health system in WA around climate and sustainability. And we really had the chance to be inclusive and to hear as many voices as possible. And one of the characteristics of that was that people bring their best selves. So people um, gave written submissions, attended formal hearings from the health services and many other places, non-health um, civil society groups and told government what they were prepared doing and what they were prepared to do in partnership. So there was really a socialization process, um, which is very useful in terms of sustainability, momentum um, and ultimate um, effect. Thank you. Um, so what's important is we've heard a lot about institutional strategies. We also need um, regional and statewide strategies. So we were able to nail down the precise climate effects in different parts of the state. And we'll also hopefully soon have some kind of national climate and health strategy. Someone's asked for a link to the inquiry. If you just Google climate health WA inquiry, it'll come straight up. Thank you. And these are some of the people who gave um, evidence at formal hearings and all the transcripts are there. So literally people talking for 45 minutes each about what they were going to do and how they could contribute. A very positive starting point. Next slide, please. In fact, um, the context was different for WA. The process was different because we had time to be inclusive and um, bring everyone um, into the tent, if you like. But the findings are pretty similar, whichever climate and health report you look at. So these were the inquiry recommendations, but really they could have been found um, from any, um, any state in, in the country. Um, having said that, because the context and process was different, the implementation is also different state to state. So even it looks like the same findings or recommendations, the process whereby you then implement that, and we've been, we're now two and a half years afterwards, is different. So we've had a very productive post-inquiry process in WA because we kind of set it up um, during that inquiry. So it's not just what the report says, but the process which leads to a process of social change afterwards. Thank you. Um, so I'll just skip over this. Um, the inquiry came out of the Sustainable Health Review. We used inquiry powers under the Public Health Act, which was a different to a usual policy development process. So we were independent. Our report went to Parliament, etc. The, um, there was a significant change with the 2019-2020 fires, which made the health and climate links obvious. When we started in 2019, it was difficult to convince people about those links. Now it's seen as obvious. And we also allow, aligned our report with the state climate policy, which was released the same week. After, after the report was released, there have been a number of senior sustainable development positions in WA Health. There are sustainability frameworks in pretty much every health service and 
there was a follow-up statutory inquiry into the education sector. The professional colleges have really got going and we're waiting on the national strategy. Next, next slide, please. So my last two slides. Clearly there's an, there are lessons for a big picture strategy, um, especially in a federal system like Australia. We need to have a process that's inclusive and creates a culture of all in this togetherness. And we need all of the top down, bottom up and peer to peer strategies working together and alignment, alignment, alignment. Having said all of that, I still don't believe at this point that the overall health system targets in any state or territory that I've seen are actually credible. We're not actually doing enough to meet those targets. So I do think we need mechanisms to share and scale up good practice much quicker than we currently do. And we need new initiatives to do that, a new thinking. Joining a network is great, like we've got Global Green and Healthy Hospitals, but it's not enough in itself. What I'm seeing at the moment is some plans saying, we'll have baseline emissions by 2024 or something like that. Probably not good enough, not quick enough um, for the challenge ahead. And the last slide. But the biggest uh, message I'd have from my experience after the, the inquiry is you need a personal strategy to go with the um, institutional strategy that you're working in, that context, working within your sphere of influence. The question is how? And we go back to Ramsey's first point about resistance, but also support. You need a personal strategy um, to support yourself and allow yourself to be supported and support others and then to work out how you best can use your personal skills, personality, et cetera, to overcome resistances. So the first thing to do is be really clear about how much time you've got um, and build on your own unique strengths. A lot of people are very creative. They're also very persuasive. So you can nudge and cajole and ask others for favors. You really need to use meetings and agendas and get sustainability and climate on every meeting agenda you can. We need to hold people and institutions to their own words. So if they've got a policy, you ask them how they're going with that policy. Or if they've made statements, you say, how are you going after you said you were going to do that? So don't use your own words. Don't create new advocacy. Hold people to their own words and be a good follower. Every um, health provider has their frameworks and looks for champions and leaders. But I think we also need an army of followers. People who will just sign up to say, I, this is not my area of expertise, but I'm happy to help. And if we could have one leader and 10 followers identified in every health service, I think that's better than one leader alone. And also, of course, we have to think, because this is a whole of society problem, about how we can be influential with our other non-health hats as citizens, consumers, investors, etc. Thanks very much. Karen, thanks very much. If I could ask the panel to come up on the stage who are here in person, that would be great. We are going to have some questions now for about 10 minutes. And uh, hopefully I have some questions on the slider, which I do. Um, but I'm also willing as chair to take questions from the floor if you want to ask questions. Um, because I think questions are good. And there's not, no such thing as a bad question. All right, so I have a very easy first question, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, here it is. Uh, Ramsey, I'll get you to take it first, and then I'll ask Sue and others to perhaps uh, comment. The pandemic has seemed to be a massive threat to health sustainability initiatives. How are you, or how are we, going to manage the balance between sustainability and all the infection control and other issues that we have. For example, all the masks we throw out, all the other things that we do and waste. Easy question. It is very easy. <laughs> um, it, it's provided us an opportunity. I think the amount of stuff we've been throwing out in the last two years has created more of that tension I spoke about or pressure that I spoke about earlier and created that burning platform where everyone's saying we have to do something about all this waste. So it's actually, in one aspect, been very positive um, because it's driving a lot of us to rethink how we should deal with that particular waste. And 
how we've dealt with it is we've just got on with it. I think we haven't used it as an excuse to stop anything. We've, we've used um, the quiet period, if you like, um, for some of us to, to drive initiatives and push on with some other things. And it's actually been a wonderful distraction for, for many of our clinicians to actually focus on something positive while we were dealing with something which was so negative um, at the same time. Sue, do you want to comment? Ramsey just said everything I was going to say, so I don't know what else I'm going to say. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, look, I was thinking that we we definitely have more interest now because of what we've been through in our district in the last few years, starting with the 2019 bushfires. So there's a lot more people wanting to know what can we do. The pandemic has really increased our waste, so people are saying this is a real disaster. They're starting to see it for themselves now and they're going, what can we do? We haven't got the answers yet. This is what our waste working group is desperately trying to work on. And, and yeah, we don't have the answers yet, but we're working on it and we're thinking about it. And we're, this is why we want to work with our universities and our researchers. And we also want to work with our young people. We're, we're looking at uh, working with Sydney Science Park and the STEM challenge that they've got with their high school students. And we want to get out there and get those questions to the students because they'll come up with way better answers than we will. So Tyron emphasised urgency as a key issue. At least that's how I read the presentation or heard the presentation. How do we get more urgency into the system to make change? Because it is variable, isn't it? Across New South Wales, for example, not every LHD is doing that much, or correct me if I'm wrong, but that's my understanding. Across Victoria, that also seems to be the case, and I suspect elsewhere. So how do we get that urgency into people's minds and into the system? How do we, how do we push that? Comments? Well, I think the urgency is in response to what's happening. I mean, we live in uncertain times and, and lots of disruption, and I think that's driving that, that thinking that we need to do something differently. It's, it's about how bad is going to get, not necessarily, you know, what, what so we need to do something now. And I think we all realise that. Um, I'm, I, I also think that in order to drive change, we have to break the silos between our organisations and really drive, you know, that, that the opportunity to work on this collaborative project with Sue. That's the way that we need to push forward it is to actually band together and look at all the opportunities we have and find those ones that we can all contribute to or target different areas so that we're all learning together. Um, and Thanks. Taran, do you have any further comments you'd like to make? Um, I think we all approach that issue of urgency differently. Um, and, oh, sorry. And um, I, I, I don't think there's one way. So. You know, my initial reaction was to, you know, try and find metaphors or try to find that kind of urgency metaphor. Um, whereas um, there are other ways to do it as well. So just by urging or shouting louder or, you know, it doesn't necessarily um, lead to the impact you want. We do live in a federal system, which is an opportunity as well, because you can create little points of comparison and tension um, so that you um, hold up your own state or, you know, against other states and you use that process to drive everyone forward quicker. And so one of the key things structurally we need, I think, is to link the national policies with the state policies in a federal system much tighter together at a state level. And I'll give you one quick example, which is that in WA, the state presidents of the national colleges get together and talk about what they can do. So you bring all of that national thinking and you make it very pointy at a state level. And those people are then also influential inside their big hospital and health services, et cetera. So link it up, align, urge if you have to, be persuasive if that's your way. I don't think there's one way, but we all have to have a go. What's been the reaction of the community and is it changing the community, what you've been doing at the, at the hospital? Is that changing other parts of the system across the territory? What, what, what's happening at the community grassroots level? 
Thanks for that question. I think um, people are really thrilled. People are grateful um, that somebody's doing something. Um, and they're really glad that there's an opportunity for them to participate uh, in a way that they can do freely, they can do in, in small parcels of time. And I mean, funding is always the problem, but this is a way that people can just dig up a plant out of their um, yard, which there's a flowering native plant, it's set seed, it's got lots of uh, little seedlings and people go, I've got 10 seedlings that I've potted of this species, where would you like them? So I, I think people are really grateful for this. And in terms of the patients and community members, they can see how when they, they all know how bad the campus is. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, let everything die off in the dry season because there's been a browning policy for 40 years um, where we think just, things just die. But um, we're challenging that now. Uh, we still need to have a climate adapted campus and people need to get about their business, um, attend campus, attend meetings, work and be restored. Thank you. And there's a question here about primary healthcare networks and their value in reducing hospital emissions. Uh, does anyone want to comment on this, Sue? Do you want to comment on what's happening in your in your area and perhaps uh, that's what's happening elsewhere too? So I think commissioning um, for our state in particular is coming out through the primary care networks and I think that's important for keeping people out of hospital and the less people are in hospital, obviously, the less greenhouse house gas we're admitting. So that's a key message. Further? Thank you. That's great. And then there's a question here about how we can get the different health districts to work together. Well, that will be a miracle, but let's hear what people have to say. Is there any kind of, Ramsey, how do we get people to work together? Okay. Well, or well, I think, two first, if yeah, you'd like. Look, yeah. I think having the ministry unit now, um, the Net Zero unit and the network forum that we all attend monthly and it's open to all staff we're already starting to in this space work together really closely I think and we're, we're I think when it's a, it's been said earlier today this is not a com competitive area this is a collaborative area and everyone wants to work together and they want to share and they want to you know go here take this use it feel free to go with it so. So we're nearly out of time. Are there any questions? Oh. <laughs> okay. But we won't you, stop. The question was about something. working together and you cut me off there, Nick. I would <laughs> never do that. Please, please give us your comments. Sorry. I, I was just, I was just going to make the comment about one of the things we don't want to, my advice or my view is we, we don't want to be zealots around sustainability that um, because it actually turns people off if you're too radical. Um, it's okay personally to do that, but when you're dealing with a large bureaucracy like New South Wales Health or New South Wales Government, you have to find different messages which other people, which resonate with other people. So there are people who work in New South Wales Health who don't believe in climate change, but they do believe in saving dollars and reinvesting them in clinical services. So we have we create messages that appeals to those people. There are people within New South Wales government who may not be interested in climate change, but are interested in cutting a ribbon and getting votes. So let's put a big solar panel on our hospital that you can come and cut the ribbon to. So part of our approach is um, we believe in climate change and we want to reduce carbon emissions, but we try to find different messages that are going to appear uh, appeal to different cross sections of the organisation um, and get them engaged and invested in, in the process. All right. And if there's a question here about engagement of teams and, and you know, how people at, at the lower echelons, in inverted commas, can really contribute here, there's obviously a lot of interest in doing so. It's been talked about earlier today as well. But any, any further comments on how people can get engaged who aren't currently engaged but are passionate about doing so? What, what should they do? Should they call the CEO? What, what should they do? Well, it, it, it depends. So we, we have people in our hospital here at John Hunter who have been running sustainability issues for many years but have never managed to get them off the ground. You need that central group like Alyssa and myself and people who will help champion those ideas, share that knowledge with other parts of the organisation, provide, organisation provide a little bit of funding to buy whatever it is they need to buy, um, a compactor or, or equipment or talk or, or beat their way through the policy and red tape, which is New South Wales Health, sometimes to get things put in place. But what we've done is set up 
you know, we've got about 15 to 20 sustainability action groups that are in their little local areas in their local geographies. They've got a chairperson. We provide them a template of, of how you might run a project and we let them drive their own initiatives and we suggest a timeline and we stay in touch with them and we talk to their board chairs um, and we just try to give breathe life into all their projects um, without being too onerous for that for being too onerous on them because they they have their day jobs as well and a lot of these people are doing it in their own time. So look, we're out of time. I, I want you to put your hands together to thank the panel and the presenters who all did a fabulous job. Thank you very much. And I now pass this on to uh, Roland Sapsford, who's the CEO of the Climate and Health Alliance. Thanks very much. Thanks, Nick. Uh, well, as I said, my name's Roland Sapsford. I'm the CEO of the Climate and Health Alliance. I'd just like to begin with our acknowledgement and commitment, which is the Climate and Health Alliance recognises that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are the traditional custodians on the land on which we work and live, and we acknowledge that sovereignty of the vast and ancient web of nations, which we call Australia, has never been ceded. We commit to listening and learning from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people about how we can better reflect Indigenous ways of being and knowing in our work. Um, to round out our discussion, hasn't today been inspirational? I mean, just wow. You know, it's been fantastic, right? And, and to kind of round that out and help each of us carry forward that sense of possibility and inspiration, I'm really delighted to introduce two final sessions. First up, we have the Caring for Country videos, and then Professor Jennifer Martin will offer some reflections on the day. I'll introduce Professor Martin in a minute, but first, Caring for Country. And as said in our uh, commitment statement, central to a more sustainable future for this land is the need to listen to and learn from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander ways of being and knowing. And this includes, among many, many things, opening ourselves to understanding the power of story and lifting up Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices. This Caring for Country session is a new and, in my view, long overdue addition to Greening the Healthcare Sector Forum, which aims to showcase health services that have embedded concepts of caring for country and Aboriginal stewardship values into the work they are doing. And in designing today's program, we made a decision to put caring for country at the end so it did not get subsumed into another session. And it was the experience you have front of mind at the end of the day. Um, I want to acknowledge um, uh, the people on the steering committee who brought this idea to life. And I invite you to watch these videos, both for the stories that are told and for the deeper lessons that each story embodies. So could we have the videos, please? There was an art competition and I didn't know much about what was happening or where it was going. I just, I thought it was just a small piece. I could go in the hospital. I thought it was just maybe a little framed photo. And then I turned up to the hospital and I seen this giant steel wall of art that was just my design. And it was just shock that they liked it that much. Hi, I'm Brock. I go to Crookle High School. I live in Crookle and I'm a proud UN man. I didn't even think at that point that it was mine. I thought it was, it just kind of hadn't hit me yet. It made me very proud that, like, they chose it. It was a very exciting opportunity for us to work with the National Aboriginal Design Agency and Saltwater Freshwater Arts Alliance, and we were absolutely delighted to receive uh, Brock's artwork that is about a meeting place, about healing and about connecting to each other. When I made this artwork, I wanted it to show that there were people moving with the water, camping alongside it, living alongside it, and it just to show how connected we are with the land and how much we need it. I think that the Aboriginal people knew how important it was to look after the land. You can't just live off it. You need to respect it and give it time to heal and I think that 
the country as a whole could take a couple notes from the Aboriginal people. I'm just so proud of him because he has struggled as a kid and for him to be in this position now, like he's glowing, like he's, he's happy and just to see him like that, I'm just super proud. I think it's amazing that the Aboriginal culture is getting shared more often now because it's, it's sort of gotten lost and you can see it getting out more and more. Like this project has definitely inspired Brock to look more into his heritage and I'm pleased that it's someone younger that can just keep passing it on for generations, hopefully. <coughs> I'm so excited about engaging young Aboriginal artists in our arts program at Health Infrastructure. They may not want to be artists when they grow up, but it might inspire them to want to be nurses or doctors or clinicians in healthcare settings and create new ways for Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities to experience a better healthcare future. If I was going to say something to the younger people, just give it a go. You don't know how far it's going to take you. I didn't think I was going to get all this happening to me, but I'm here now doing interviews about a giant hospital art piece. Everything is connected within this country. So how the water is connected to the land and how those two are connected to then our trees and connected to our animals, but most importantly, they're connected to ourselves as well. And with that, then it's our seasons are connected with each other too. So where we know it's four seasons all year round, we have close up to 20 different seasons. So it's all about caring for country is about keeping that balance. But um, for our families, it's about being those stewards, uh, taking on that custodianship and making sure that balance is actually maintained. So by continuing the stories from very, very long ago, and, uh, continuing the traditions as well. This is why we have our Dreamtime stories. This is why we have our songs and dances. It's actually paying our respects to our plants and to our animals and to our country. <coughs> to actually share the story of the country because we believe that by singing the songs, doing the dances of our country, we're keeping the spirit of that country alive. If we keep, so if we stop talking about our country, it'll be forgotten and it'll actually disappear. It's a good thing to have these strategies because people are in the rooms, like patients are in their rooms almost 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, with a lot of my patients that I see, it's really good for them to actually get outside into those parks in areas, um, like the Reflection Garden, for example, there, where they can actually uh, get a bit of sunlight, get a bit of grass between their toes, lay down on the grass. That, that's the one main thing, is just to lay down and just take in nature and just by doing that for half an hour it makes a huge impact on our patients throughout the day so they're not just looking at the four walls and a big window and waiting for someone to come through the door they're going outside and they're getting that air into their lungs they're feeling the warmth of the sun they're feeling the country they're feeling the plants in there and that just that is a big makes a big difference when they come back in. I was involved in, in some of the plant identification. Uh, they, I was asked what kind of plants should we plant inside that garden. Um, so we could plant sort of some plants that were medicinal, but also bush tucker as well. Some were actually trees are indicators as well, um, seasonal indicators too. To care for a country is to care for ourselves as well, because you know at the end of the day, we are part of that country. We are the country.
Nian Maruku Paran Wian Wanarua Miramalikan Paraani Parakupa Machan Nian Maru Wian Narakai Parapa Yurakai Kel Panakel Machan Kupaka. We acknowledge the Wanarua people, traditional keepers of this land and we pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Welcome to the Maitland Hospital. I've always worked in my Aboriginal community organisations and was encouraged to uh, get my art out and shared with the broader community. My initial thought when I was invited to be a part of this initiative and work on the artwork was, wow, 75 metres long, it's huge. I was also excited and started to visualise what this could look like and what it could mean for us today and into the future. And traditional lands in Maitland were wetlands and some of the aerial shots showed those big wetland patches in the dark shape of the earth and they were actually the big U-shapes that depict people in traditional symbolism. So uh, that was kind of twofold. This connects to country and people and people on country. But then talking about people, we wanted to ensure that we uh, acknowledged and elevated our elders and in doing that brought an acknowledgement of all traditional custodians but also looked at past, present and future. Working with that brisket and trying to bring these themes that were coming out into the design, they're a natural uh, material and they linked directly to the ochres on cave paintings and handprint paintings on country. So that connection was there also, that colour palette and the use of the natural uh, materials because uh, the sand engravings that we see on country also uh, was really uh, something that was highlighted within the design as we went and talked to community. I think the overall artwork impact can <coughs> share right there at the site those local stories and narratives and people can learn more about traditional culture and Aboriginal people today across that Wanarua nation. More than a few things I think in there resonated with other presentations we've heard today. Um, uh, for me, I guess, a key lesson from these is that there is great power in simply creating space and making culture visible. And I hope that we can, at this forum and in many other places, share many more positive stories in years to come. It's now my pleasure to introduce Professor Jennifer Martin, I, I hope is here because I haven't had a chance to say hello yet, um, to reflect on our day. Professor Martin is a physician and clinical pharmacologist at New South Wales Health, an academic at the University of Newcastle and a director on several non-profit boards. Also of great interest to me, she's a keen ocean swimmer and a lifelong cyclist, which is something we share in common. And she has advocated for safer cycle facilities in the health workplaces that she's worked in over the last 35 years. Thanks, Jennifer. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roland. And, um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And I think um, that attraction to enjoying the environment and really respecting the ocean are really key links, I think, both with health um, and I think also links with um, the environment and sustainability and thinking about our environment uh, for the future. And I certainly think with both cycling and ocean swimming, you develop quite a respect for nature um, you have to cycle in the rain, you have to understand weather patterns and have to respect, I think, uh, the changing climate that we're seeing because it really affects um, outdoor activities. Um, but thank you. And I just want to say kia ora and uh, yama and many thanks to everyone actually for prioritising this meeting uh, this week. Um, it has been a really inspirational day. Um, it's been, you know, just incredibly amazing to hear the quotes and the, the speeches. And I think one of the quotes um, that we heard several times today was about, uh, you know, in, in order to care for yourself, you really have to care for country. And I think if that's one take home message um, for me, I'll certainly be taking that home. I'm oh, sorry, I'll sit behind here. Um, I should have a roving one. <laughs> um, but I think, um, you know, that it's, where is it? Oh, yeah, okay, cool. Um, I think um, because, it, I mean, it is so important, isn't it, this whole this whole area, and I think because it's so, um, I'm sure that's the reason why there are so many people who have attended today, 
Um, and I think there have been quite a few face-to-face -face meetings and conferences over the last few months, but this is a, the one that I've been at that's, that's had actually the most attendance. Um, and we're all very busy, but this is an absolutely critical area for all of us, not just in health, but I think more generally for the community. And the presentations today have really um, alerted us to that fact and also that we really need to get our skates on because this is happening faster than anyone had predicted. Um, I do want to thank uh, Kaha and the whole team for organising this. Um, I think I'd like to thank also some of my clinical colleagues um, who have actually been in the space for a very long time. I don't want to single out any particular one because I know there's been a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of groups. Um, but uh, there are several that were actually involved in this area before it became trendy. Um, so we're all thinking about, you know, parties and socialising on the weekend and travel and getting in a big plane and going to conferences. Um, my colleagues, um, uh, Professor Capon uh, um, uh, and uh, Professor Tully, both of whom were speaking publicly um, way before the medical profession had accepted that this was a very major health risk. Um, I know Dr. Bone has also been out there um, much earlier um, than the, the, the general momentum in health. I think we're all in it now. We can't hide from it. We're seeing it every day across the whole health spectrum. But I think those early leaders in the clinical space have really pushed that, that agenda of health um, and the fact that you know, climate change and our loss of biodiversity really has incredible health impacts on all of us and is actually having impacts now. Um, so thank you um, to those clinical colleagues who have really... Um, I've been in that space for a long time, but of course, our Indigenous people have been here longer than 30 years, 65,000 years, in fact, um, and those traditions of uh, interconnectedness um, and, uh, uh, and just care for country and looking after country and those relationships, I think, you know, that's absolutely incredible, and we've just been really quite negligent in not acknowledging that, I think, in the non-Indigenous population, um, but now we have an opportunity, so there's no excuse now, um, but I do pay my respects to this incredible culture. Uh, and the people, and uh, thank you for caring for country. Thank you to Sharon, um, who works at the John Hunter, and we had quite a few discussions today, and, uh, and Stacey and Moramai and Awapakal peoples, also for the work that we saw today, um, and areas outside the Hunter, but in particularly, um, including locally. Um, I think that's really, um, yeah, fantastic. They're actually seeing um, those people really uh, step up and uh, make sure we're aware of that when we're building a big innovation precinct right next to this building, that we actually think about the impact on our local people, on our culture, on the land, and what that means to our relationships and our connectedness. Um, and I think um, I did just want to thank uh, all of those people for really pursuing this agenda, even when, it, as I said, it wasn't loud in the media, and to my health colleagues, um, you know, well done for leadership and energy in the space. And at this point, I think I was going to put a, put a picture up of Nick Tully with a, um, with a megaphone, but I'm not sure that we really got organised enough, but um, we, do we do actually have Nick Tully, Nick Tully with a megaphone uh, leading a student protest um, when there was an appointment of a coal chancellor of one of the biggest um, uh, coal mines um, in, in this area uh, to the chancellorship of the university and uh, the students were very unhappy about this because uh, they worried about the future and what this sort of signals the future of our region. And it was really quite a turning point, I think, for the community because students, they weren't even medical students, they were general students at the university, uh, really felt quite passionate that their organisation was not sort of um, leading in the right direction. And um, there was Nick Tully um, with, a, with a megaphone with the students uh, co-leading the protest and really going hard on the health um, the health aspect and pretty much said that um, uh, there, there is some background there. Actually, Nick didn't need a megaphone. He was quite fine on his own, but uh, uh, his message was really widely uh, heard and uh, I think the media picked that up. Uh, the Doctors of the Environment also got behind um, this issue and I think it really became quite a pivotal point for this whole issue of health and climate change. And in a regional town like Newcastle where we've got coal and a lot of pe people are facing the loss of their potential jobs and income, income and what that means for their quality of life, that our region actually has more to lose than the whole of other regions in Australia. And it's probably about time we needed to provide that leadership um, generally, but particularly from a health community. So I wanted to thank also uh, Kaha and, and the DEA, Doctors of the Environment, um, who spoke up on that. And also some other unlikely health um, champions, including the surgery department here at John Hunter with uh, Dr. Rob Eisenberg, uh, who has set up um, a voting app, 
that you can use on any election around Australia. I understand, I know you used it for the last federal election and you could actually rank all of your election candidates based on their, um, their interest and their commitment to biodiversity and climate change. So if you haven't um, yeah, got that, just uh, get in touch. You can probably just Google it, but uh, he visited all the teals and uh, really was quite excited, I think, when uh, he saw that Australia, the community had really voted, I think, uh, for a change. Um, I, th I think that um, there's uh, a lot of other groups also in health, and we had some of our junior medical staff that were here before. My own registrar, John Hunter, this morning was telling me about sustainability group. She's got going um, with, uh, at, at our hospital. Um, her main issue is that uh, there's a difficulty with um, the difference between having great ideas and heaps of energy and then being able to actually get that past um, the layers of, of, of bureaucracy. So I think that if we're in an organisation where we do have layers of bureaucracy, we probably need to engage our members on the ground and just find out what they're doing and how we can help them um, because these people don't need money. Um, they just want the permission to start uh, really uh, pushing these uh, projects through and, and improving the way we're doing things. And you know, we have a number of examples on our ward today where we could make significant improvements in our sustainability agenda in drugs and pharmacology, which is my area, but also just in the requesting of pathology tests and what happens to all of those, that pathology waste. So they're big areas that we can definitely make a difference in just in our own local area in the Department of Medicine here. So I think that um, that speaks to Taryn's point uh, that he highlighted today, that we all have a, you know, a personal duty and a responsibility. So we don't need to sit around today waiting for the person at the top of the organization to give us permission. We've actually got a duty and responsibility to get on with that now. Um, I think that uh, we were given some tips on how to do that actually in the feedback session on data, which was earlier in the day. Um, the question was, do we need to wait for all this data to be able to pursue um, projects? And I think, you know, if you're trying to change something at the top, you do need data because the organization still has to be financially sustainable. Um, and, uh, but the interesting thing is uh, that actually often the two things are aligned. So. If you can offset your energy bills by solar, that's actually, you know, potentially a saving for the organisation as well as uh, improving our climate um, and biodiversity agenda. So we do need data for a sort of strategic wide approach in an organisation. But I think if locally you can be doing things that really improve it, uh, I'm not sure how much data we need to do that. And I think that was highlighted by the panel uh, mid-morning as well that brought up um, some important uh, aspects. Um, in that regard. Um, I did really, it struck me uh, quite a number of times that, um, you know, let's just say it's, it's absolutely fantastic to hear the sustained um, input that we've had from our local Indigenous uh, people, um, engagement and our leadership and health uh, services and, our, and, uh, and the focus on sustainability. And we have just seen that with some of our videos here. And I think Brock's Indigenous artwork is really, um, it was a stunning installation, wasn't it? At Goulburn Hospital, I think what's happen happened at Maitland Hospital, um, the work being done in Sunshine Coast, that's really absolutely fantastic. Um, and uh, I think that if we can move from having non-Indigenous and Indigenous as separate items, but start to think about how we embed Indigeneity through all of our decision-making, that was actually highlighted in the last talk as well. But it really should be something that we have um, uh, on every agenda. Um, I picked up that point too because it was actually a wake-up call for me that we should have it on every agenda, the Indigenous aspects, but also a sustainability um, agenda through that. I think that um, one other point uh, that came up actually in the last panel when we were talking about, and maybe I highlighted just now with our uh, junior doctors, you know, how do people who've got really good ideas actually get through the layers of management, whether it's in the state health or our own organisation. And I think we shouldn't forget the role of the board. So the board obviously oversees management and we're pretty lucky even locally that our board has really supported a sustainability agenda. And when the board can then instruct management to deliver that, that's actually you know, a really important signal. Um, the board does have a duty to, to, to listen to stakeholders. There's often a, quite a few channels for stakeholder voices to be brought to the board. And I think that's another way um, of people actually ensuring that people are aware of where there's potential uh, opportunities for projects and sustainability. The other good aspect of from board, um, well, what's happening in the board space, um, and I'm not sure how many of you um, 
uh, are interested in this, but I think if you are, it would be worth looking looking up. But um, the Australian Institute of Company Directors is actually quite interested in the new sustainability standards that are coming. So there's a climate change standard. Um, so these will be mandatory reporting standards, just like we have mandatory reporting standards for, for fi financial aspects. So um, it's, it's, it, you can just look it up, sustainability standard. Um, but there's climate change is already out there. There's discussion about a biodiversity uh, reporting standard as well. And that means that boards of organisations, corporate, not-for-profit, will have to report on climate change and biodiversity just as they report on other standards. So I think this is really exciting. And if you're on a board, um, maybe you should ask about that, uh, whether your board's actually um, aware of it and what uh, actions they're taking to actually uh, include those sustainability standards um, uh, going forward. Um, and I think that the Australian Institute of Company Directors and other uh, sites or other organisations that support board directors um, will also be able to have some educational resources that might help your board. So just keep, uh, keep aware of that, I think, too. Um, I think um, uh, some other points that were brought up this afternoon were talking about collaboration. Um, it was highlighted this morning, too, so particularly in the research space that you know, we're much more focused on collaborating with our research projects as opposed to competing. And I think that's a new way of, of moving forward. So I encourage people to reach out to their colleagues and to think about a collaborative project across state borders, potentially, um, and across organizations. Um, and I think, you know, lastly, if I can just sum up, um, uh, and I think, actually, I found out that one of my colleagues might also be in, uh, Indigenous New, New Zealander today. Uh, and now I've said that there's no going back um, <laughs> because I think I might have <laughs> outed him. But anyway, I think that's actually really important because it made me think about, about New Zealand and indigeneity. And, um, you know, New Zealand has been, has embedded indigeneity in everything it does for a number of years, probably because of Te Tereti or Waitangi, which is a treaty Waitangi, and, uh, you know, how to look after our treasures. Um, and I think that we could probably look at New Zealand health system as well in terms of embedding. Um, uh, and I think that uh, New Zealand also has this, um, uh, this way of um, thinking about the, to, uh, basically it's, it's the way we have protocols um, uh, in New Zealand. It's te reo, the language, um, te reo may honour tikanga, which is a, um, how we actually run our meetings from an indigenous perspective. And we might want to think about that, I think, going forward uh, in the climate space as well. Um, so I, if I can just finish off with a reminder um, from Dr. Uh, Weira Mantri and Tally, I think we do need a big picture strategy as well as our own individual projects. And I think this organisation is the right place to be leading it, and I'm excited to be part of that. Um, but we also do need that personal strategy we need sustainability on every agenda, and it's, there's something that we can all do. Um, and I'll finish with an excellent quote, I think, from uh, Nick Chally, that, you know, we've had COVID um, and it was pretty stressful for our whole society. It is an opportunity as well to, to think about the way we do things going forward, but actually climate change and our loss of biodiversity makes climate change look like a picnic. So, um, you know, let's just lift the bar, eh, everyone? Yeah, uh, all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you on the bike. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're nearly there. Right? It's been a fantastically inspiring day, but also a long day. And I just want to touch off a couple of things. So it, as mentioned at the start of today, this is the 11th Greening the Healthcare Sector Forum that Climate and Health Alliance has uh, coordinated. And encouraging and facilitating collaboration is really part of why CAHA exists. Um, the momentum for sustainable healthcare is snowballing. While um, we were meeting today, uh, we just got a letter saying the South Australian uh, Health Service has joined other states in signing up to Global Green and Healthy Hospitals. So um, things are happening every day. And I guess after listening to today's presentations, I'm more convinced than ever about the need for networking and collaboration if we're to create change at the pace that the ecological crisis demands of us. Um, many speakers have emphasised the importance of just starting. 
And it's through the examples of others, some of which we've heard today, that many of us get inspired to start somewhere. Knowing that change is possible can be a great motivator. So I want to thank you all, speakers and attendees, both in person and online, for being motivators, for giving it a go, and for the gift of your time in being here today. In a world where time and attention are scarce, your engagement speaks volumes about our shared commitment and shared belief that we can create sustainable, just and robust solutions together. And with that, I want to thank the people who have made this event possible. Our partners in this year's forum, uh, Hunter New England Health District, um, who have offered such inspiring examples during the day. Our hosts today, um, the HMRI, our major sponsors, Mott McDonald and Multiplex, without whom this event would not happen. Um, our exhibiting sponsors, 2XE, CBRE, EcoAid and Miltech for their generous support and our promotional partners for spreading the word. I want to thank the steering committee, which has helped develop this event over many months. And finally, but by no means least, I want to thank, this is a CEO's prerogative, I want to thank the people who've sweated over details and skillfully navigated large and small crises over many months. Stephanie Carino, Ben Mowat, and Alyssa Klankenberg, thank you so much. And I will also acknowledge the unseen heroes, um, Sam and Millie and Remy, who have been making the technology work out there in the world. So thank you very much. Um, and with that, we are finished. Though, of course, our work is far from done. Um, go most well. We have dinner and drinks at the Duke from six. 69 Regent Street, New Lambton, somebody knows.